Um, good afternoon, everyone. I was just wondering if everyone could just stand up for 30 seconds, just have a very quick stretch, um, loosen up some muscles. Wonderful. You will thank me for it later, I'm sure. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. We've got a time. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> Very quick agenda there. That's a J Jacob standard template, that one. Um, one thing I thought that I might mention right at the very start is that uh, this topic is one that's very difficult to put a pound sign against. There's been an awful lot of uh, mentions of money over the course of, uh, of today. Um, this is a bit of a tricky one, and uh, I, I don't have a pound, pound number to give you, so I apologize in advance. Stevenson's rocket. At the time, the pinnacle of transport technology had maxed out at a staggering 30 miles per hour. <sighs> Must have been staggering for people at the time. Now time to pose a question to you. What do you think it would take to get Stevenson's rocket compliant to standards now? <laughs> I think it's fair to say we wouldn't recognize it, and much like Trigger's broom, there probably wouldn't be much left of the original. You wouldn't do it. That's why it's locked away in beautiful York Museum now, preserved so people can acknowledge its history. You may also think, come on, Michael, the rocket wouldn't be practical for use these days. So what then about railway infrastructure? It was also built in the style which was appropriate and considered safe for its time. I'm going to leave that thought in your head for a while. Why are we talking about this? There is a decarbonisation program. I'm not going to go into it. There's been plenty of discussion already today. There is a drive for a rolling program of electrification. This means that you can hand a set of coordinates for, let's say, 10 miles of existing railway to a contractor, and in a magical world, they come back to you six months later, all complete, ready for the next one. No gaps. The other reason I wanted to bring this up is because it's a very real issue uh, in the electrification world. I believe the mention of heritage listed assets immediately signals the word unknowns. Rightly so, it's very difficult to plan for. How has heritage come about and what's considered heritage? I will get to the electrification in a moment, but in order to set the scene, I need to provide a little more context. Heritage assets have been identified as being worthy of protection via designation, such as scheduled monuments, listed buildings and conservation areas. There is legislation in place to protect these assets. There are associated consenting regimes designed to manage impacts on these heritage assets. In the UK, the historic environment is an integral part of the planning consent process. When we're talking about railway heritage for today, it's typically stations, signal boxes, viaducts, footbridges, and other elements of historic railway infrastructure. Please note, these items can be anywhere along the network. However, there may also be potential harm caused to other elements of the historic environment not associated with the railway. For example, works associated with the railway network, though not directly impacting the bricks and mortar, particularly where works require land take from outside in our ownership, but still within the heritage listed area. How do we get from a listed structure to an electrified network? Let's say local man Joe Bloggs has lived in a village his whole life and has documented the history of a signal box. With enough evidence, Joe achieves a listed designation of the signal box. Congratulations, it is now protected. Many moons later, there are plans for an electrification scheme going past the signal box. 
the local authority who maintained the box uh, called up and shown a single option selection design. All parties are happy with the solution and the project is given a listed building consent based on these drawings. The project needs this document. Then everyone goes on their merry way. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Oh, and by the way, the fines for not progressing as per the listed building consent you received based on your single option selection design, £20,000 and or six months imprisonment. Uh, that can be charged to an individual and is not covered in PI insurance. And I told you I wasn't going to give you a pound number. Stakeholders. Who's involved? Imagine this is an artist's paint palette. You may be forgiven for thinking the two major players here are the rail engineering side and the historic environment Scotland, Heritage England, Cadu, if you're in Wales, uh, and all the local authority. Nice and easy, job done. Not necessarily. Each and every site might involve the electrification scheme itself, bonding, maintainer, some form of structural assessment, architecture, the existing rail network, local or national government, the people holding the purse strings, the funder. Safety, very, very important one that every discussion needs to have. Every discussion needs to have safety involved in it. Community groups, the general public, those that live nearby. Local councils in there twice, uh, largely because if it's grade one, uh, it's covered by a national body. However, obviously the local council would also be involved and be impacted uh, as a result of this asset. And local developers. One item not mentioned on this pallet is constructability. That's a tricky one to know when they start to get involved. However, if the design solution means many, many concrete trucks using the roads, there obviously may be some uh, further discussions to be had. So it's an important one and hard to place. The, the reason I gave the uh, paint palette analogy, every original painting has used different techniques, colours and processes to get to the final product. Some might be more orange, red by, led by rail engineering requirements. Others might have a central green figure, strong objection or opinion from the local community. It is difficult to predict what the final outcome will look like. This is to demonstrate that the final solution for this heritage listed asset cannot and will not be a carbon copy of another. Might be similar, but not exact. Remember, the heritage asset has achieved its listing because it's unique. Some numbers. Put a, uh, a set of, uh, obviously, requirements that we need to achieve as OLE engineers. There's obviously an awful lot of millimetres in there. We need to be this many millimetres from this thing, this many metres from this thing. And we use that, obviously, as a starting point. Uh, Gary mentioned, of course, uh, the, the opportunity to, to challenge these standards later on. Um, obviously, that's a very, very good starting point. I then uh, mentioned the heritage and the NR guidance. Uh, the network rail guidance is very, very useful and uh, provides an awful lot of information on uh, how you could go about starting the process, uh, particularly for stations, um, canopies, bridges, etc. Uh, relevant legislation includes the Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Act of 1979 and the Planning, Listed Building and Conservation Area, Scotland Act 1997. It is worth mentioning here that Historic Environment Scotland, Historic England and Cadu in Wales all have very user-friendly websites that everyone can access. In fact, one of them, Historic Environment Scotland, 
been kind enough to publish what is their policy for managing the historic environment. One example of this. Changes to specific assets and their context should be managed in a way that protects the historic environment. Opportunities for enhancement should be identified where appropriate. If detrimental impact on the historic environment is unavoidable, it should be minimized. Steps should be taken to demonstrate that alternatives have been explored and mitigation measures should be put in place. I think that one's particularly pertinent to what we're talking about today. Thought I'd give you a, a real life example. So if I were to take a single approach, just looking at standards example uh, of a heritage listed location. What does it look like? Well, a bit like this. All of the numbers add up. There's no derogations. And from a compliance perspective, all the boxes are ticked. All you need to do is lift the heritage listed footbridge by one meter and relocate the heritage listed canopy and Bob's your uncle. It's very easy to say, isn't it? You are all now wise enough to say that there is more to it. I did say I'd give a real life example uh, and here you have it. And I did talk with Gary before this presentation. So uh, Steventon has come up again. I do apologize in advance, but it's just such a good example. Steventon Road Bridge, built by Brunel, brick arch. One of three access ways to the village of Steventon in glorious southern England. Great Western Electrification Project had a plan. We will give the village a brand new fully compliant bridge, which in theory will require minimal maintenance. Thinking back to the paint palette, rather monochrome painting, but it does the job. The proposal was rejected. Please try again. The site had Flooding issues. So those of you thinking track lower, sorry, no can do. Two level crossings, uh, just to make it even more fun. Grading standards, which uh, if you want more information on, again, I can highly recommend speaking to Gary Keener. Um, I've been to his presentation on that, and it's very, very good. And a, a very vocal parish council as well, just to, uh, just to add even more colour to the, to the, uh, to the painting. Many, many years of discussions back and forth resulted in a reduction in speed, significant testing to ensure this one location would function. The NR guidance that I mentioned before gives a suggested time scale of two to three months for achieving that listed building consent. Um, sometimes that will happen. In other cases, it's simply not going to happen. I think what this demonstrates is that it's really worth starting the discussion as soon as you possibly can. Again, mentioning the uh, rolling program of electrification. For a majority of the time where this was being discussed, it obviously makes it very difficult to build this. Uh, and this is not a determinus. Um, this is just outside of Didcot, which does break up your electrified network if you've built all the way from the west and all the way from the west. Uh, it's, uh, from a rolling program, it makes it very, very difficult. Just some things to consider. By electrifying and by starting the conversations as soon as possible, there is an opportunity to enhance or encourage community. There's an opportunity to increase footfall or introduce efficiencies. Application of standards is one factor. There is an opportunity to challenge these. There is an opportunity to leave a legacy. It is difficult to automate. It's worth mentioning that you cannot just press a button and have a, an electrification solution through this heritage listed lo location. And it is very difficult to satisfy everyone. It's, it's worth having in the back of your head, but again, very, very hard to put a pound sign against it. When the PWI invited the speakers 
we were given a list of factors and themes to aim for. Of those, I've selected three. Every aspect of cost must be challenged and addressed. In the current environment and with the current process, my topic today doesn't have a defined value you can assign to it. And yes, the majority of the work will be open route with straights and curves and bridges and tunnels. However, these heritage assets need special treatment. As a result, I present to you a challenge. Simplification of the supply chain. I'm not going to go into that. That's more than been discussed today. The other one I wanted to highlight was repeatability. Obviously, a lot of these heritage assets are unique. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been given the recognition they deserved. 200 years ago, there was no rule book. And so, as the railways evolved, so did the standards and the styles of the time. What this has resulted in is 200 years of opinions and ideas. Now we have a situation where the intention is to apply a standard electrification approach everywhere we can to 200 years of ideas. Think of it like shoe sizes. Though everyone has an opinion on what style shoe is right for them, at least there is a chance you can find one the right size. There needs to be some flexibility, though perhaps not so flexible that we go down very, very bespoke paths. In conclusion, I hope that this presentation has given you an idea of some, if not all, the stakeholders that will be involved in every location. The formal process uh, that, again, if you go into the NR documentation, very, very useful for seeing that going through. Highlighted how there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. It will be as unique as the asset itself. One very final thing that I thought, just, just as, as I was sitting there, um, rhetorical question for you. Who has the timeline to meet for this electrification work? There's been an awful lot of dates mentioned in this. However, a lot of the heritage listed items we're talking about uh, are there. They're not planning on going away anytime soon. And also, they don't have to achieve anything at a certain time. Um, I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you very much.